This, this is the mop-up for September 12th, 2023. More than a dozen casinos owned by MGM Grand Resorts are under cyber attack as we speak. Their websites are down and some guests are still reportedly locked out of their hotel rooms. Slot machines and ATMs are unavailable. Restaurants are unable to accept charge cards. MGM Grant has 48,000 hotel rooms on the Las Vegas Strip alone. Room keys are of no use. All the MGM properties are affected, including the Bellagio, New York, New York, and MGM Grand on the Las Vegas Strip, the Borgata in Atlantic City, and MGM Grand casinos around the country. Such a tragedy. So sad that people can't lose their homes for about 48 hours. Let's pray and hope that MGM Resorts will be up and running again and people can lose their kids' college funds once again. It's called Storm Daniel. Officials in Libya say it's responsible for catastrophic flooding in the eastern city of Derna, where 2,000 are feared drowned, possibly more. A spokesman for the Libyan army puts the number of missing as high as 5,000. As you know, Libya is in the middle of a civil war, which many fear might hamper rescue efforts. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says 2023 is going to be a record year for climate disasters here in America, climate disasters that cost more than $1 billion each. So far, there have been 23 major weather and climate-related disasters that exceeded $1 billion. And so far, it's cost this country a grand total of $58 billion in damages. This is another subsidy for the oil companies. The oil companies, which create this climate catastrophe, don't reimburse us. We have to pay $58 billion a year in damages. This does not include Hurricane Idalia, which hit two weeks ago. 253 Americans have been killed in these climate events. In 2022, there were 18 climate events that cost more than a billion dollars. We're already at 23, and it's still September. The contract that the United Auto Workers have with Detroit's three major car makers is set to expire at 11.59 this Thursday. UAW President Sean Fain warned if a deal on a new contract isn't reached by then, he will launch a strike against all three immediately starting on Friday. Usually they pick one automaker. They're changing their tactics. The UAW is going to go after all three. Automakers have announced record profits for, for years now since we bailed them out. They've been announcing record profits quarter after quarter. And the head of the UAW, Sean Fain, is demanding a 20% wage increase and to get rid of a two-tier system when it comes to pensions and health care. A majority of auto workers hired after 2007 are considered hourly workers who are not eligible for pension benefits or health care. That was the compromise that the UAW made to get the auto industry back up on its feet, and the auto industry checked their profits. The auto industry is up on its feet. The UAW is also concerned that the switch to making electric vehicles requires 30% fewer workers. The big three automakers have already embarked on a joint venture making batteries for their electric vehicles, and the UAW is upset that the jobs in these new battery plants are non-union and pay far less than what auto workers are accustomed to. But here's how the mainstream media covers this, right? It's never about the workers. It's what a strike is going to do to you, the consumer. This is the headline from Bloomberg. Even brief UAW strike seen causing billions in U.S. economic damage. A 10-day work stoppage would reduce U.S. GDP by five point, what is it, six billion dollars. We The GDP... Forget the auto workers and their families and the economy in Detroit and Ohio. It, we have to save the GDP, even though most of us don't participate 
in the gross domestic product. As Bobby Kennedy said, the GDP measures everything except what makes life worth living. Tony Downs Food Company, its headquarters in Mankato, Minnesota, agreed to pay a $300,000 fine after an investigation conducted by the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry discovered children as young as 13 were operating meat grinders, ovens, and even forklifts. Some of these children worked overnight shifts and were exposed to dangerous quantities of carbon monoxide and ammonia. As you know, many red states now are making it much easier for children under the age of 16 to work in places like a meat processing, pl- meat processing plant without needing any written permission from their parents. Despite SAG-AFTRA and the Writers Guild being on strike, actress Drew Barrymore announced that she is returning to work on her daytime television talk show. In making this announcement, Barry Moore said she supports the strike and, quote, I own this decision, and I'm guessing she owns the show. The Writers Guild on Monday surrounded her studio and protested as audience members filed in to watch her scab and turn her back on both SAG-AFTRA and the Writers Guild. Two audience members who were handed Writers Guild pins to wear on their lapels during the taping, took their seats, and then were forced to leave. They were escorted kind of forcibly out of the building uh, because they were wearing Writers Guild of America lapels. Is that even legal? Can you force a studio member to leave the audience just because they're wearing a pin on their lapel that shows solidarity with the labor movement? How is, how, and how is that disruptive? A spokesman for the show said Drew, Moore, Drew Barrymore wasn't aware that the audience members had, in fact, been thrown out. Of course she wasn't, because she's a saint, just like Jimmy Fallon, right? According to a new study conducted by the Bloomberg News Service, ever since the Supreme Court's decision against affirmative action... Earnings calls conducted by CEOs of America's top 3,000 publicly traded companies have seen a 54% decrease in any mention of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Republican lawmakers, including Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, are all threatening legal action against these companies, as well as proposing legislation to divest state-run pension funds of any investment in companies that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it seems to be working. CEOs of America's top publicly traded companies no longer care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're afraid now of Republican lawmakers punishing them. That's a great, that's a great cause in life, right? To, to be against diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's something to tell your kids. How how was your day at work, dear? Great. I I fought diversity, equity, and inclusion. Good for you. We're proud of you, Daddy. Re- IRS researchers in 2021 announced that America's 1%, the wealthiest 1% here in America, hide more than 20% of their earnings from the United States government. So on Friday, IRS Commissioner Daniel Werfel put the wealthy on notice. Your days of cutting corners are over. Thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, the Internal Revenue Service now has more money and personnel to start cracking down on rich people who don't pay their taxes. Plus, they're using artificial intelligence. They're saying that new advances in artificial intelligence help the IRS track down tax scoff laws. The IRS announced it is targeting 1,600 millionaires and 75 multi-billion dollar businesses that owe the government hundreds of millions of dollars in unpaid taxes. The Internal Revenue Service is supposed to receive $80 billion in additional funding over the next couple of years, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act. But Republicans chipped away at that number earlier this year as part of their agreement to raise the debt ceiling. The Republicans don't want the IRS to work, right? Because they're all about fiscal 
responsibility. And whenever you say Medicare for all, we say, we say Medicare for all, and the Republicans say, how are you going to pay for it? And we say, by collecting taxes that are owed to us. And Republicans go, oh, uh, no, we're, we're, we're against Medicare for all because we're against taxes. So, no, no, we serve the rich. Meanwhile, 50.6 million American children are returning to our public schools. It's autumn, or it's almost autumn. But this year, there's no longer a federally guaranteed free lunch. Thank you, Republicans, right? We don't believe in taxes, so starve to death. During the height of the COVID pandemic, the federal government made free lunch available to every kid, but that expired last September. Now, some states, all of them blue, they offer free lunches. They've picked up the slack left by the federal government. Uh, these states offer free lunches and or breakfasts, 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 morning meals. These are the states, and they're all blue. Did I say they're red? They're blue. California, Vermont, Massachusetts, Colorado, Michigan, Maine, and New Mexico. All blue states, right, that somehow find a way to feed their school children and maintain easy access to women's reproductive needs, like abortion. Place like Texas, you know, you got to keep the kid and you're on your own after the breasts dry up. We don't feed the kid. Well, Monday was the 22nd anniversary of 9-11. President Biden didn't attend any ceremonies in Washington or New York. Instead, he spoke at an Air Force base in Anchorage, Alaska, on his way home from Vietnam. Never forget, never forget, we never forget. Each of us, each of those precious lives stolen too soon when evil attacked. Ground Zero in New York, and I remember standing there the next day and looking at the building. I felt like I was looking through the gates of hell. It looked so devastating because the way you could away from where you could stand. No, no. It's like you getting arrested trying to see Mandela. You, that's not true. No, don't do that. Don't. I'm voting for you. Don't don't make it harder than it already is. No, Joe was not at Ground Zero the day after 9-11. He was in Washington, D.C. Even George W. Bush waited until September 14th before he went to Ground Zero, picked up his bullhorn, and famously promised to avenge this heinous atrocity by invading two countries that had absolutely nothing to do with this. Remember that? We invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, and they had nothing to do with 9-11. So, yes, Joe Biden told a little lie, tiny, teeny, weeny, weeny little lie about being there at Ground Zero. But all our presidents lie about 9-11. Some tell big, dangerous lies that gets people killed and then harmless little lies that, you know, make us all feel good. Joe Biden's little teeny, weeny lie I'm voting for him. It's not as bad as the lies told by his predecessors, okay? If we were going to invade two countries for 9-11, right, they should have been Saudi Arabia, where Osama bin Laden was born and where all the funding for the attacks came from, and Pakistan, not Afghanistan, Pakistan, which served as a training ground and haven for Osama bin Laden, which is why he was killed not in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan. Now, I don't believe we should have attacked any country. This was a police. We needed international police to take care of this. There was no need to go to war over 9-11. But if you're going to attack, you invade Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. But you can't because the Bush family did business with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan had nuclear weapons. So do what America always does. Pick on the weaker country as long as everybody there isn't white. The Taliban, this is the uncomfortable truth that's considered disrespectful to our soldiers, but it's the truth. The Taliban had nothing to do with 9-11. But Obama, when he ran for office, lied and said he was against the war in Iraq because he said we took our eye off the ball by not go going all in 
on the war in Afghanistan. He would say Afghanistan is the country that attacked us on 9-11, not Iraq. And that was a lie as well. Afghanistan had nothing to do with 9-11. The Taliban had nothing to do with 9-11. Al-Qaeda set up shop in the hills of Tora Bora, and they were traipsing back and forth between the caves in Tora Bora, and then they were going into Pakistan. The Taliban viewed Al-Qaeda as just another tribe they had to deal with. So Obama lied. Bush lied about 9-11. And Joe Biden? Well, here's why I'm voting for Joe Biden. He told a little teeny weeny lie that he was at ground zero. But on the important stuff, he opposed as vice president Barack Obama's surge in Afghanistan. Biden wanted out. He said, let's get out of there. We don't belong there. And when he became president, the first thing he did is he got out. He got out two years ago. It was one of the bravest acts of any president. He ended this ridiculous 20-year war, 20, what, how many years, 20-year war in Afghanistan. He ripped the Band-Aid off and got us out of there. And it was messy, but not as messy as staying there. And that's why I'm voting for Joe Biden. You say you want peace? He gave us peace in Afghanistan. And people say it was clumsy War is clumsy, and so is retreat. He, he lied. He told a little lie about being there uh, for Ground Zero. Uh, everyone lied about 9-11. Every president told big lies about 9-11. Of the past four presidents, Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden, Biden's lies are the least, the least harmful. He lied about where he was on 9-11 uh so we never forget yeah well you forgot but that's okay this is uh as opposed to donald trump's lies okay this is from the washington post it's from 2015 right after trump came down the escalator and called mexicans drug addicts and rapists headline from the washington post trump's outrageous claim that thousands of New Jersey Muslims celebrated the 9-11 attacks. Compare this lie to Joe Biden's little teeny weeny lie. This is from the Washington Post, okay? 2015. This is a transcript that the Washington Post printed. It's Donald Trump on with George Stephanopoulos Sunday morning. And here is what George Stephanopoulos asked him, okay? This is... This week with George Stephanopoulos, he says, you raised some eyebrows yesterday with comments you made at your latest rally. I want to show them it's relating to 9-11. So they play a video clip of Donald Trump in which he says, hey, I watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down. And I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. Thousands of people were cheering. And Stephanopoulos comes out after the video and says, you know, the police say that didn't happen. And all those rumors have been on the internet for some time. So did you misspeak yesterday? And Donald Trump says, it did happen. I saw it. Stephanopoulos, you saw that? Trump, it was on television. I saw it. Stephanopoulos, with your own eyes? Trump, George, it did happen. Stephanopoulos, police say it didn't happen. It didn't happen, right? But that's the kind of lie that gets people killed, gets Muslims banned and killed. There, there, were, there were no Muslims in Jersey City cheering. This has been fact-checked. But Donald Trump's big lie, there were people that were cheering on the other side of New Jersey where we have large Arab populations. They were cheering as the World Trade Center came down. I know it might be not politically correct for you to talk about it, but there were people cheering as that building came down, as those buildings came down. And that tells you something. It was, what does it tell you? So it, you're lying about Arabs cheering that the World Trade Center came down. 
uh, and that tells you something. It was well covered at the time, George. No, it wasn't. It was a rumor on the Internet. Now, I know they don't like to talk about it, but it was well covered at the time. There were people over in New Jersey that were watching it, a heavy Arab population that were cheering as the buildings came down. Not good. Yeah, that's the lie. One of the many lies that Donald Trump told about 9-11. We never forget. We must never forget. So the conservatives are all over Joe Biden for his tiny little lie, but we should never forget 9-11. It's very important that we never forget 9-11. That's why the sports book Drafts King honored the memory of all the people who perished on 9-11 with a 9-11 themed parlay where you could bet on the Jets, Mets, and Yankees to win on Monday night, September 11th. I'm not making this up. This is an actual screenshot. Never forget, the never forget parlay. Bet these New York teams to win tonight on 9-11. Ah, isn't that great? So classy, so good. So you could bet on the Jets, the Mets, and the Yankees to win on September 11th. And, you know, I'm a patriot. Uh, I, I love... New York, and I don't want to forget 9-11, so I bet on the Jets to win by 9, the Mets to lose by 11, and the Yankees to charge $911 for general admission. Meanwhile, it's been 20 years, 20 years since the mastermind behind 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, was captured in Rawalpindi, Pakistan on March 1st. Uh, 2003. What, what's that you said, David? The mastermind behind 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, was captured in Pakistan on March 1st, 2003? I don't understand. He wasn't captured in Afghanistan, who we invaded, or Iraq, who we invaded. He was captured in Pakistan on March 1st, 2003? But all our presidents told us that Afghanistan is responsible for 9-11. Then why was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed captured in Rawalpindi, Pakistan on March 1st, 2003? You know, uh, that was March 1st, 2003. 19 days later, we invaded Iraq. The mastermind of 9-11 was found in Pakistan on March 1st of 2003. 19 days later, we invade Iraq, and nobody says, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Iraq was behind 9-11, but the mastermind is in Pakistan? Well, why, uh, why did it take 20 years to give Khalid Sheikh Mohammed a trial? 20 years. Even the Nazis got the Nuremberg trials. No trial for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Why not? Well, we tortured him 183 times that we know of. That's, that's what the record says. And that's just the waterboarding. We waterboarded him 183 times. And waterboarding is torture. According to the Geneva Conventions, waterboarding is torture. Plus, they beat him, they forced him to sleep naked, then they deprived him of sleep. And here's the thing about torture. It doesn't hold up in court because it violates the Geneva Conventions, and it turns out people will confess to anything when you waterboard them. It's why, according to the Geneva Conventions, it's a war crime. So they keep announcing we're going to put... Khalid Sheikh Mohammed on trial, you know, he's been held in Gitmo for 20 years without a trial, uh, but he's doing better than half the de detainees in Fulton County Jail. You got you to give it to the Pentagon and these military commissions. He's gone 20 years without a trial, but he's still doing better than the half the detainees in Fulton County Jail uh, because... Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he got to go before a judge. He was given a lawyer. He was arraigned. Okay, he got an arraignment. But according to the ACLU, half the detainees at Fulton County Jail, where Trump had his mugshot taken, half, half 
have yet to be indicted or arraigned, and some of them have been in there for years. So Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he's doing better than half the people in Fulton County Jail this morning because he was arraigned and told what he's been charged with. Ralph Norman is a Republican congressman from South Carolina and a member of the ultra-right extremist Freedom Caucus that is now threatening to shut down the government. Why are they threatening to shut down the government? Well, according to Ralph Norman, Joe Biden's a terrorist. Here is Congressman Ralph Norman invoking the memory of 9-11 and Osama bin Laden and telling us why we need to shut the government down because it's Joe Biden who's the terrorist. Eli Crane being one of the real heroes of, uh, of what we're trying to do with government. But government's not going to do it on their own. Um, and Osama bin Laden, he, he did his part to destroy it from the air. And the internal bureaucrats are doing their part to destroy it uh, from the inside, unfortunately. And the Biden administration is front and center stage. How's that for honoring the people who died on 9-11? Osama bin Laden destroyed our government from the air, and the Biden administration is destroying it from within by, what, keeping the government open? I see. This is Ralph Norman who wants to shut the government down because he's not a terrorist like Joe Biden who wants to keep the government open. And that's why he's like Osama bin Laden, because bin Laden destroyed it from the air. Did, did Osama bin Laden keep the government open from the air? I don't understand how it works. Well, this is my favorite 9-11 clip. I played it two weeks ago. It's from the Greg Kelly show on Newsmax. He had the day off. Here, here is his uh, fill-in host talking to Trump's attorney, Alina Haba. I remember, I'm, I'm old enough to remember that when the 9-11 terror attacks happened, Trump raced down to ground zero. He used his right. own money to help pay for recovery efforts. He was a hero. He was a hero to America, yeah. to New York. Yes. Who can forget? And I have tape uh, of Trump in his apartment, cowering in the corner, calling into WOR. Here is Donald Trump racing down to, well, racing under his bed and calling into WOR. It's a local television station. Donald, uh, you have one of the landmark buildings down in the financial district, 40 Wall Street. Uh, did you have any damage or did you know what, what's happened down there? Well, it was an amazing phone call I made. 40 Wall Street actually was the second tallest building in downtown Manhattan. And, and it was actually before the World Trade Center was the tallest. And then when they built the World Trade Center, it became known as the second tallest, and now it's the tallest. Mm, that's a lie. Even that's a lie. Like, not only is it tasteless, but it's a lie. This is from the Washington Post two years ago. Headline on 9-11, Trump pointed out he now had the tallest building in lower Manhattan. He didn't. This is from the Washington Post two years ago. The Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat track skyscrapers around the world. As of this moment, Trump's building at 40 Wall Street, called the Trump Building, is the 32nd tallest building that either stands in New York City or is slated to be built there. Well, you know, it's a lie, but you got to believe. You got to believe. Even if he's a liar, you have to believe in him because he's God's chosen. This is MAGA Pastor Shane Vaughn. And he reminds us that Trump is the chosen one, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I played you that clip last week when she was the White House spokesperson. She said, Trump is the chosen one. Jesus, God picked Donald Trump. And you got to believe, you got to believe no matter what. Go ahead, MAGA pastor Shane Vaughn. I had a man literally leave my church this week because I mentioned Donald Trump in the pulpit mixing religion and politics. Let me tell you something. I hope I lose everybody if that's what they lose for because God called me to stand up for America, to stand up for Donald Trump, and it'll be a cold day in the gates of hell before I ever shut up. Everybody can leave. 
Amen, brother. Please continue. The problem with preachers, they're scared to death to mix politics with religion. You cannot separate politics from religion. They are one and the same. So you are against separation of church and state because why? You cannot separate politics from religion. I see, I see. And Donald Trump, God's chosen, Jesus' brother, really, he's working the evangelical vote. They love him. They are sticking with him. Here is God's chosen, Donald Trump, over the weekend, speaking to a crowd in North Dakota or South Dakota, East Dakota, one of, the Deco- one of the territories we should never have given a state to, or at least doesn't deserve two senators each. Here is God's chosen, Remember, the Democrats are the radicals on this issue because they're willing to kill babies in their fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth month, and even after birth. They're willing to kill babies. So when politicians talk about this, they have to say that they're the extremists. Because if you're willing to take a baby out of the womb in the eighth month or the ninth month or after the baby's born, remember that crazy governor, the past governor from Virginia, where he said, when the baby's born, you make a decision. This is why religion belongs in the public square, because it elevates political discourse. Right, Pastor Shane Vaughn? Dead babies! That's right. Trump Hotel is in Chicago. There's a Trump Hotel is in Chicago, and it's being fined $12 million for sucking 20 millions of gallons out of the Chicago River each day for its cooling system, and then pumping 20 million gallons of water back into the Chicago River. That was agreed upon. What wasn't agreed upon was that the 20 millions of ga- 20 million gallons of water that they were going to pump back into the Chicago River would be a temperature so high it killed the fish in the Chicago River, resulting in dead babies. Yes, dead babies. The attorney general of Illinois wants Trump to pay $12 million in fines. Trump says his insurance companies should cover this, but a district judge on Monday ruled, no, it's not covered by your insurance. Pay up. Well, This man is being persecuted. God's chosen, Donald Trump, is being persecuted. And it's times like these when I call upon Pastor Joshua Feuerstein. Pastor Feuerstein, they're coming for Trump. All these indictments and fines. Tell us what to believe in. You don't have to wear the mask. You got Jesus. You don't need the vaccine. You got Jesus. Yeah. You don't need the mask. You got Jesus. You don't need the vaccine. You got Jesus. And COVID. And COVID. Let's go to my pillows CEO, the my pillow guy, Mike Lindell. He the state attorney general, Mike Lindell. uh, And I don't know if you can see the cross around Mike Lindell. This is yeah, he likes to wear the cross. He's very religious. He's a sweet man. Mike Lindell, the state attorney general of Illinois, wants to find Donald Trump. God's chosen one for dumping 20 million gallons of scalding water into the Chicago River. How dare him? How dare him? How dare him? That's right. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the Chicago State Attorney General? Kiss my ass. Kiss my ass. What a good Christian soldier you are. Pastor Shane Vaughn, your thoughts on the Illinois Attorney General imposing a $12 million fine on God's chosen one. Dead babies! That's right, dead babies. Well, last week we reported on Senator Tim Scott, the South Carolina Republican who wants to be the nominee for president, even though he's black. And Republicans, I don't know if you know this, hate black people. It's a party of racists. I mean, they really, really hate black people. And the one thing Republicans hate more than black people are unmarried black men. Tim Scott is black and he hasn't found the right woman. And now conservative donors are saying they they don't want to give him any money because he's not married. He's not even engaged. So on Monday, Tim Scott went on Fox News to set the record straight. And by record, I mean him. And by straight, I don't mean him. What is your status? 
Well, obviously, uh, at this point, I'm taken. I have a wonderful girlfriend, and uh, we have a wonderful relationship. The good news is uh, God has blessed me with a smart Christian woman. That, that's great news. That's great news. God blessed you with a with a, a Christian woman. Let me guess: is it Mercedes Schlapp's twin sister? Could it be Merce- Could it be Matt Schlapp's wife? Does Mercedes Schlapp have a twin sister? Go on, Tim Scott, who was a confirmed bachelor, was a virgin, pr- a proud virgin until he was thirty. Uh, and go on, explain. We, we met your mom. Will we meet her? Will we meet your girlfriend? You will, of course, at some point. Okay, great. Yeah, we're going to meet his girlfriend just as soon as she fills out the same non-disclosure forms Phyllis Gates had a sign before she married Rock Hudson. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I just... I find it funny when people hate who they are. Tim Scott hates who he is, and he's dangerous. Charlie Kirk runs Turning Points USA. He's a college dropout who's trying to spread the Republican, white, conservative, Christian nationalist message to college campuses. And over the weekend, he spoke at an evangelical church. Now, he's not an ordained minister, but he is a bigot. And with this church, that's good enough. The one issue I think that is so against our senses, so against the natural law, and dare I say, a throbbing middle finger to God, is the transgender thing happening in America right now. A man or a woman or whatever. He's very upset with uh, Leah Thomas. She's a transgender swimmer who competed on the University of Pennsylvania swim team. You hear that, William Thomas? You're an abomination to God. You hear that, William Thomas? You're an abomination to God. What a, what a good Christian. What a good man Charlie Kirk is. He calls Leah Thomas William Thomas because Charlie Kirk, good, loving Christian that he is, refuses to recognize Leah Thomas's pronoun or her first name. Why is that loving Christian disciple of Jesus, Charlie Kirk? We are in a church, and so it's important to remember Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman shall not wear a man's garment, garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Wow. Abomination. So uh, a woman can't wear men's clothing and a man shall not wear a woman's cloak. But you're raising money for Rudy Giuliani's defense. Look at this video from 20 years ago, Charlie Kirk, when Rudy and Donald Trump put together a little sketch for the Friars Club. We've all seen this. You know, you're really beautiful. And a woman that looks like that has to have her own special scent. Oh, thank you. Maybe, maybe you could tell me what you think of this scent. Hmm, I like that. This, this may be the best of all. Oh, you dirty boy, you! Oh, oh! Donald, I thought you were a gentleman. Hm. You can't say I didn't try. Who would ever believe that was the least humiliating thing Donald Trump ever put Rudy Giuliani through? Well, there's Rudy Giuliani dressed. I mean, he's a dead ringer for who? Uh, Marilyn Monroe. That is America's mayor, Rudy Giuliani, wearing a woman's cloak. Charlie Kirk, your thoughts on this? I mean, you're all in on Rudy's defense. Every time I turn on turning points, you're trying to raise money for Rudy Giuliani. There he is in women's in a woman's cloak. You're an abomination to God. Wow. Mike Lindell, Charlie Kirk just called Rudy Giuliani an abomination to God. How dare him? How dare him? How dare him talk that way about Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump, two good Christian men who represent Republican, white Christian nationalist values, and people want to lock these guys up and call them liars and hypocrites. That's God's chosen one. 
how can the evangelicals not love Donald Trump? Look at him. What a great... Yeah. Uh, yeah. How dare him? Uh, Pastor Shane Vaughn, your thoughts on Charlie Kirk calling uh, Rudy Giuliani an abomination? Dead babies! Yes, dead babies, exactly. Rudy Giuliani is still trying to raise money. Here he is on Eric Bowling's Newsmax show Friday, and Eric Bowling made an interesting point about Peter Navarro, the economic czar under Donald Trump. If you remember, he was found guilty of contempt of Congress four days ago. And here is Eric Bowling, the host of the Eric Bowling Show on Newsmax with Rudy Giuliani. Mr. Mayor, Navarro, get the latest. It, it seems like with all these courts, all these jurisdictions, if you're a Trump associate or if you're conservative, you're guilty until proven innocent. What say you? What say me? You're, you're guilty until proven innocent. But Peter Navarro was just found guilty. You left that out. He was found guilty. But Eric Bowling still says if you're a Trump associate, you're guilty until proven innocent. He was proven guilty. Well, last week, Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, was told by a federal judge that no, 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 you cannot be tried in a federal courtroom. Meadows, if you recall, was indicted along with 18 co-defendants down in Georgia for attempting to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Two weeks ago, Meadows tried to convince a federal judge during an evidentiary hearing that he should be tried in a federal courtroom because, as White House chief of staff, all the crimes he is alleged to have committed were committed while he was a federal employee. But the judge last week said, nah, yes, you were the White House chief of staff, but you weren't uh, doing White House chief of staff stuff when you arranged that call between the president and the secretary of state for Georgia. That was campaign stuff. And so, no, you're going to be tried in Fulton County. So on Monday, lawyers from Meadows filed an emergency motion asking to appeal the judge's ruling. And in their motion, they revealed that Meadows is in a state of panic, as well he should be. The lawyers pointed out that if we don't speed up the appeal, Mark Meadows could conceivably go on trial as early as October 23rd, and they warned he might be tried and convicted before Christmas. In the motion, they said he could be tried and convicted. You know, it doesn't sound too optimistic. It doesn't sound like uh, his lawyers are... Uh, think uh, he's he's in trouble. On Monday, Donald Trump's lawyers filed a motion requesting that the federal judge in his Washington, D.C. election interference trial, Judge Tanya Chutkin, recuse herself because she's black and she's a woman. Well, that's not what his lawyers said, but that's what Trump is thinking. Lawyers for Trump did ask her to recuse herself because of previous statements she made while sentencing other January 6th defendants who were found guilty. And they say that her comments reveal that she would be prejudicial towards the prejudicial Donald Trump. Pre prejudicial, it's a hard word to say. Here is what uh, Judge Tanya Chutkin said while sentencing a Capitol rioter. She said to him, the people who mobbed that Capitol were there in fealty, in loyalty to one man. It's a blind loyalty to one person who, by the way, remains free to this day. And they think that makes her prejudicial. Well, we've been following the story coming out of Colorado where six voters, citing the 14th Amendment's insurrection clause, are suing the Democratic Secretary of State insisting she must scrub Donald Trump's name from the ballot. 
As most of you know by now, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment forbids anyone who held state or federal office and then participated in or aided and abetted an insurrection is then forbidden from ever holding elective office again unless two-thirds of both houses of Congress vote to restore his rights. Donald Trump's lawyers responded to this lawsuit last week by filing a motion to have the case thrown out. They accused the plaintiffs of, quote-unquote, election interference. On Saturday, Jenna Griswold, she is the Colorado Secretary of State. She's a Democrat. She's the first Democratic Colorado Secretary of State since 1963. She was asked about Donald Trump calling it election interference, She said Donald Trump is a liar with no respect for the Constitution. I was kind of surprised. I thought she was kind of like laying back, wanted to see what happened. Turns out she welcomes this lawsuit. She said she has every intention to see this 14th Amendment lawsuit all the way through. In which case, before Election Day 2024, the Colorado Supreme Court will be forced to rule whether January 6th was in fact an insurrection and whether Donald Trump participated in it. Not, you, you, not, they don't have to determine whether or not he led it. Did he participate in it? And then, of course, it, it, it goes before the Supreme Court, which means what? I have no idea. Uh, but I do know the same lawsuits are pending in Arizona, New Hampshire, Anywhere there's a Democrat who's secretary of state, chances are crew is behind this. And uh, I, I, would, I suspect any state that has a Democratic secretary of state, they're going to file this lawsuit. And, uh, you know, I don't know what happens. If Trump is convicted in Georgia before Election Day or by special counsel Jack Smith... Uh, our nation's Supreme Court theoretically could rule that based on sufficient evidence, he's not eligible to run for office. Our, oh, it's our Supreme Court. That's right. I forgot which country we live in. Well, Donald Trump is a liar and he's stupid. He's a stupid liar who lies to stupid people. And bankers who dealt with Donald Trump for decades said they were shocked by how little he understood about the mechanics of finance. Most of you remember that when Trump was president, he placed tariffs on Chinese imports, especially agricultural products. And then as president, he bragged that this was going to cost the Chinese billions of dollars. And it soon became apparent to everyone that Donald Trump didn't understand how tariffs work. When Trump put tariffs on Chinese imports, it costs Americans more to buy Chinese products. It doesn't cost the Chinese government anything. This is what protectionism is. Tariffs make Chinese imports more expensive, so Americans buy agricultural products from domestic farmers. That's what a tariff accomplishes. It costs China nothing. But Trump kept insisting, imbecile that he is, that he was charging billions, that that these tariffs were going to cost China billions of dollars, and that billions of dollars was going into our treasury because of the tariffs, and he was going to take those billions of dollars and pass it along to the farmers. He was told repeatedly how tariffs work, but he said, I like the way this sounds instead. So here he is lying to farmers in North Dakota, West Dakota, well, you know, one of the Dakotas that gets, like, they have more senators than they have people living there. Here he is lying about China and the tariffs. South Dakota farmers, I have, nobody's ever taken care of the farmers like like President Trump. As your president, I took on communist China like no administration in history, bringing hundreds of billions of dollars, as you know, pouring into our treasury, hundreds of billions. 
They didn't like me too much. Actually, I think I got along very well with them considering what we were doing, but what we were doing was fair. When no other president had ever gotten literally 10 cents, they never had 10 cents. We got hundreds of billions. I gave our farmers, out of the money that we got, $28 billion. That's why I say your state, Iowa. I'm going to Iowa tomorrow. I said somebody, and I, I don't like to say it too often because I don't believe in doing that or I knock on wood. I have a lot of wood. This is a real wood. A lot of these things are plastic. This is the real deal. But, you know, I don't like saying things like nobody else could do this, nobody else. But nobody else could have gotten you $28 billion for your farmers. And I said to the people of Iowa, I said to the people of Nebraska, who are represented very well, Charles, I said, we can't possibly lose, because I got the farmers $28 billion from China. Nobody else would even think about it. Nobody else would think about it. And I'll just tell you, you know, a guy who was very disloyal because I got him elected, so I call him Ron DeSanctimonious. He strongly opposed my protection for our farmers. I protected our farmers very simply. And by the way, those farmers got big checks. Any farmers in here got big checks? Yes? Yes. Oh, he's happy. But that goes to the people, that goes to the workers, it goes to everybody. But we had 28 billion. I said, nobody else is going to be able to do that. I said, there's no way I'm going to lose farm states. But very simply, De Sanctus sided with the communists in China, and he fought very hard that this not take place. They did get checks. It was from the CARES Act. The farmers did get checks. But most of it went to big ag and not family farmers. But it's just incredible. What stupid leaders breed stupid people. I mean, that entire audience, I don't want to have contempt for these morons, but uh, it's not their fault. A president is supposed to explain what tariffs are. You know, the New Deal, the fireside chats where Roosevelt explained how the how banks worked. Remember that? Now you just have Donald Trump lying about tariffs or believing that. I don't I, he he's he's not that stupid. Well, maybe he is stupid. I don't know. I, they said, as I said earlier, the bankers were amazed by how little he understood about the mechanics of finance. Well, here's another lie. He tells about Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Here he is calling the January Sixers pro-life Christians who are being treated, who are being persecuted by Joe Biden. And he's saying, and we've heard other Republicans like Ron DeSantis say this, that these January Sixers would not be treated this way by Joe Biden if they were Antifa or Black Lives Matter. And that's why I think he's acting so weak with so many countries. It's for the pro-life Christians and others who Joe Biden has thrown into jail, facing 10, 15, and even 20 years in prison for protesting and free speech, while Antifa and other groups burn down cities, kill people, go free, and don't even, in many cases, get prosecuted. Okay, so I'm, indulge me, I'm going to, I'm, going to address this. I addressed it on Friday's show about Black, Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Antifa doesn't exist, right? Uh, the head of the FBI, Ray, said Antifa is an ideology. No such thing as Antifa. Very quickly, and I'm going to be doing this as long as they keep repeating the lie, I'm going to repeat the truth. This is from the Washington Post, October 16th, 2020. Google it, look it up. Headline this summer's Black Lives Matter protesters were overwhelmingly peaceful. Our research finds police and counter protesters sometimes started violence. The violence came from police and counter protesters like Kyle Rittenhouse, who was welcomed to Mar-a-Lago after he was acquitted very quickly. This is written by Erica Chenoweth and Jeremy Pressman, October 16th, 2020. Google it. Read this Washington Post very quickly. The data on those protests shows very little violence. Here is what we have found based on the 7,305 events we've collected. The overall levels of violence and property destruction were low, and most of the violence that did take place was, in fact, 
directed against the Black Lives Matter protesters from the Washington Post. Police were reported injured in 1% of the protests. A law enforcement officer killed in California was allegedly shot by supporters of the far-right Boogaloo movement, not anti-racism protesters. The killings in the line of duty of other law enforcement officers during this period were not related to the protests. And as long as Republicans keep spreading these lies about Black Lives Matter and Antifa, I will take one minute out of my show to remind you what the truth is. You have to combat lies with the truth. Well, before we wrap it up, Senator Josh Hawley is running for re-election in Missouri, and he's introduced a bill, or he's about to introduce a bill, that will cap credit card interest rate at 18%. And he's a Republican. This is something the Democrats should be doing. The problem is our president is from Delaware, where credit cards are king. I mean, he is uh, a friend to the credit card. So this is what Josh Hawley is doing. He's painting Biden into a corner. It's a smart move, and the Democrats should respond. Here is what he said about credit card debt in America. Americans are being crushed under the weight of record credit card debt. The government was quick to bail out the banks just this spring, but has ignored working people struggling to get ahead. Well, is it faux populism if Josh Hawley introduces legislation that that caps credit card interest rates at 18 percent? Here is what he continued to say. We have a long history in this country of statutes at the state and federal level that prevent what we used to call usury, an old-fashioned word for ripping off working people, and we need to get back to it. Would the Republicans actually get behind a bill that caps interest rates at 16, 18%? Uh, would the Democrats get behind a Republican bill? They didn't get behind the Loan Shark Protection Act, uh, which caps credit cards at 15%. That was introduced in 2019 by Senator Bernie Sanders and AOC in the House. So Biden Bidenomics, as they call it, is successful. The American people, a new Wall Street Journal poll shows that the American people are happy with the way the economy is going, but they're not happy with the way Joe Biden is handling the economy. They're happy that unemployment is at record lows, that inflation seems to be cooling down. They, they're, they're optimistic about their own financial health, but they do not like Bidenomics. They don't think Joe Biden is handling the economy well. Is it a messaging issue? We don't have time to talk about this uh, this morning. But if Josh Hawley is going to introduce legislation capping credit cards at 18 percent and Bernie and AOC want to do it at 15 percent, it would be great to address the greed that we're seeing from the credit card companies. Household debt. Before I go, I want to go over some stats that the Federal Reserve put out this week about debt. Uh, in this, they've just come out with how the second quarter of 2023 turned out for America. The, the uh, American people, in terms of household debt, owe $17 trillion total. That's mortgages, student loans, auto loans, and credit card balances. It increased $3 trillion since the end of 2019. So right before COVID hit, uh, 
since since COVID, Americans have increased their debt by three trillion. It's up to seventeen trillion. Student loan debt is at one point five trillion dollars as of our second quarter of twenty twenty three, and thanks to Joe Biden, federal student loan payments have been suspended until October, until next month. If you owe, if you're one of the people who owe part of that $1.57 trillion in uh, student loan debt, you got to start paying it back in October of 2023. If you miss your payments, however, those loans will uh, not be reported to credit bureaus until 2024. So, uh, we do have a debt problem, not the federal debt. We have a problem with household debt that uh, if Joe Biden, he's trying. I mean, the Supreme Court overturned his student loan forgiveness. Uh, it's hard to blame Biden for some things when you look at this court and uh, what the Republicans want for this country. I did not want Joe Biden. I wanted Bernie, but I voted for Joe Biden, as did Bernie. Elections have consequences, and this would be a different country if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, who I voted for, even though I wanted Bernie. If Hillary had won in 2016, this would now be her second term, and the Supreme Court would be quite different. There would be four Supreme Court justices picked by Hillary Clinton. Four out of nine Supreme Court justices would have been picked by Hillary Clinton. Four. Donald Trump picked three. Biden picked one. Roe v. Wade, student loan debt, the eviction crisis, affirmative action. We're looking at a completely different country if Hillary Clinton won in 2016. So problematic, yes, but elections have consequences. And as bad as the Democrats are, this would have been a much better country. The arc of the universe would have bent towards justice had Hillary Clinton won in 2016. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Well, please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to my channel. Uh, please sign up for my newsletter. Thank you to the moderators in the chat room for keeping this uh, conversation that I have with the listeners, civil. Thank you for all your comments. Please, please leave a comment. I read all your comments. If you're a longtime viewer of this show on YouTube, you know that I read all your comments, and you can see that uh, I address uh, a lot of your comments uh, in the show. So thank you all. Have a great day, and I will see you at 12.05 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. Thank you.